So thank you for the great introduction. Um, and I'll be talking about digital phenotyping. And I wanna first give credit to the two PhD students who did uh, almost all the work that I'm gonna be talking about that are uh, I'm co-supervising. Uh, this is George Albers here at Tilburg University, who is also funded on a Tilburg University grant, the IMPACT program. Um, and uh, Karen Vandenberg, who's a, a PhD student at Maastricht University and a clinical psychologist at Eindhoven. Um, so what I want to talk about today is uh, predicting and modeling momentary well-being and why at the outset should we care about momentary well-being. And the critical thing is that we're, we're gaining more and more importance that um, all of the facets that make up well-being are important not only for our physical health and our mental health in the short and the long term, but that they play a critical role in supporting all the other aspects of our life, our social life, um, our educational life, our work life, and everything else. And it's becoming more and more clear that understanding how uh, our well-being is changing on a moment-by-moment -moment basis is has direct consequences for both our uh, sort of immediate well-being, but also the long-term well-being. And I think that it's increasingly a focus um, of re research. And this has really led in the last couple of years to the, an explosion um, in research under the heading of digital phenotyping of well-being. And there's a couple of uh, criteria that the research kind of needs to meet in order to satisfy the criteria of digital phenotyping. The first is that it's the quantification of individual level human states. And it is happening at a moment by moment basis and hopefully using passively collected personal digital information. And I'll, I'll kind of flesh that out as I go along here and give you a number of examples. And this is most popular for clinical populations where um, there's real um, uh, clinical issues with um, the, the mental well being and mental health of um, the patients but it's increasingly being used for non-clinical assessment, um, particularly in adolescents. And I'll show a couple of examples from our lab uh, where it's being used today. To give you an overview of what, what I mean here is that the, the target is to infer what I've labeled here as the active sensing. This is where you, you're, you are asked, you know, how anxious are you feeling? How stressed are you feeling? How lonely are you feeling? How depressed are you feeling? And you give an answer, usually on a Likert scale, I'm feeling four. Um, this is relatively invasive data to collect, and it's relatively in, in, uh, expensive in time. You have to ask this question over and over again to someone um, to build up a, a moment by moment uh, model of what, what they're doing. The goal is to be able to predict what state people are in, the, 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 the digital phenotype that they are experiencing at a moment based on passive sense. So that's the left column here. Things like this is coming from Melcher here. These are all uh, things that can be measured on somebody's phone. You could also imagine wearables as well as ambient sensors um, could all be used to uh, build models that link passive sensing to inferring the active sensing state. Um, and I've kind of labeled in the middle here that a lot of researchers um, are either aggregating or building representations of what I've, I've sort of labeled as theoretical concepts. Things like social activity is really, there's a number of signals that you might be able to collect that inform you about the social activity that a person's engaging in. And the social activity may actually be linked to multiple different well-being states, something that I'll kind of come back to over and over again. How does this end up being implemented? Well, what happens is if you look at the phone on the left here, you see done in yellow, I don't know if it's big enough to read, but this is um, the, the, the phone collecting the passive data, um, sort of logging what's going on at whatever level um, is, is part of the, the, the project. At the top, you're actually collecting the active data, uh, the active sensing. This is asking people uh, with surveys or questionnaires how they're feeling at the particular time, usually with a, a particular focus on particular uh, phenotypes that you want to study. And then the once you've collected some data, usually from uh, multiple people, you build a model that is, is connecting these two data sources um, with the idea that then that model can then be generalized and put uh, onto other phones and used by other people to infer their state given the, um, the passive sensing that's being collected on the other phone. So today I want to walk through four digital phenotyping studies that are coming out of our lab. 
Um, first, correlating procrastination in adolescence with using dynamical structural equation modeling. Uh, then two projects looking at predicting uh, sleep and stress in adolescence using uh, machine learning techniques. And then finally, looking at the temporal dynamics of mood and imagery in clinical patients with multi-level factor auto, vector autoregression modeling. That's where we're going the rest of the way. So first, the correlates of procrastination in adolescence. What we're looking at here is building models that are aiming to predict procrastination or to understand procrastination on the far right based on not the notifications that are showing up on a phone, the screen time, the amount of time that a person is spending on the phone, as well as what apps they're using and for how long. So we're sort of getting a, a sampling of different um, passive sensing coming from the phone. And the, the technique that George used in this um, was uh, a uh, Bayesian um, uh, uh, dynamic structural equation model. Um, and what we're looking for here is looking for correlations within the moment between procrastination, which is the central diamond here, and the various measures. And what we see is that there's a pretty strong relationship with total phone usage um, and a relatively strong relationship with social media and less so with other, other uh, categories of app usage and a very weak relationship with the number of notifications that people are getting or the fragmentation of how they're using their phone. But this is a, a model constructed across over 200, uh, almost 250 participants what we see if you build networks of individual people, which this technique allows, is that there's a huge amount of variation across people. The connection with total usage is pretty constant, at least across these three. But if you look at participant A, there's a very strong relationship. When that, that user is using games on their phone, they're very likely to report that they were procrastinating. But you see that there's no connection between game usage for participants B and C. Um, they're much more higher loading on videos, for instance. Um, when they indicate that they're procrastinating. We can then look at the connection weights that we infer from um, every single person um, and plot them to see what the distribution looks like. And so this is the correlation between total usage and procrastination for every person. And we see the dotted line here is zero, that most people have a positive and many people have a very positive relationship between total usage and procrastination. So when they're using their phone more, they're reporting that they're procrastinating, which gives us a pretty clear signal that if uh, we want to have an app on somebody's phone that intervenes, that might be uh, something that, that you would end up um, wanting to track and uh, use as a, as a predictor. But if you look um, at the other aspects of it, that for some people, um, they're, for, for at, at every top here, there's some people who have a strong relationship with all the other app categories, but it's really, if you look at the majority of people, there is not a strong relationship for all of the other measures and procrastination. And this suggests that um, there's one feature that seems to be pretty predictive, and then you might want to learn an individual model for individual people um, on their phone, for instance, that is in indicating to them that hey, not only are you using your phone, but you're using video apps. And so that might be pretty indicative that you're procrastinating. Um, maybe you want to have a notification that interrupts that behavior, um, gets you back on task. Okay, going on to predicting sleep duration in, in adolescence. What we're looking at here is predicting an interim theoretical concept here, sleep based on screen time. And sleep is really interesting because it's correlated with lots of other outcomes, including academic performance. Um, and this is a model that was built, a uh, machine learning model that was built, um, trained on uh, around, 200, uh, around 150 people and then generalized to around 50 people. And you can see that we're doing really, really accurate prediction for the people in the training set, uh, which is maybe not surprising, but correlation of almost one. And then for people whose data we're not trained on at all, we're still seeing correlations of 0.6, which is really pretty high given that with uh, very intrusive um, intrusive sensors that we're, we didn't use in our study, the, the state of the art is currently getting about 0.7. Um, and so this is really uh, pretty exciting. Um, and we see, again, large individual differences in how well the model, model predicts both duration and if we look at then uh, predicting the self-reported quality of the sleep. We're getting very accurate predictions for many people, but then very uh, inaccurate for other people, suggesting that there may be 
again, larger than individual differences across people. We, when we look similarly at using machine learning to predict stress, so in this paper, we're now using additional information like uh, the time of day and the day it is, as well as the apps people are using and the sleep features from the previous study to predict stress, we can uh, look at the same kinds of models. So now we're looking at uh, the prediction error of how stressed people are reporting at a particular moment. And we see again, that there's a wide spread across people. We're doing pretty well for, uh, for a number of people, um, but doing poorly for some and doing really well for others. But if you look at the, if you build a baseline model that doesn't, that just looks at an individual's overall performance, we see a different story where there's some people where the, these features are just not very predictive. They're actually leading us to be worse than baseline, just predicting whatever the stable state is. But for other people, it's giving us a lot of traction, improving performance, suggesting that um, there's again, uh, large individual differences in uh, how well we can do in this task. And then finally, looking uh, instead of at, instead of at adolescents, looking at bi patients with bipolar disorder, we looked at the temporal dynamics of mood and sort of how it evolves across time. Um, and so, instead of looking at passive sensing here, we're now looking at the constellation of different uh, phenotypes. Particularly, now we've added intrusive imagery, which was theoretically motivated to be um, a, a, a co potential causal mechanism for patients with bipolar disorder to either enter manic or depressive states. And what these patients did is they self-reported their intrusive imagery, their mania, their anxiety and depression um, across many, many weeks. And what we did is we estimated a network of connections between these different states and how they evolve over time. If you look at contemporaneous connections, so what values are high together, which values are low together, we found that uh, anxiety and depression were very strongly related but the measure of intrusive imagery seemed to move along with them, suggesting that there might be some, some validity to the theory that these go together. When we then looked at how these correlate across time, how, how do they project forward, more of leaning towards a causal mechanism, we see a different story where there, it seems like there's more influence going towards the intrusive imagery than it is the intrusive imagery projecting out to these other concepts, suggesting that there may be a more complicated story underlying this. And if we regress away um, all of that, and we just look at between participants, we see some consistency across people, but uh, it's not capturing very much, suggesting that there's, again, a lot of individual differences here. So to conclude, um, what we see is that there's relatively reliable relationships and accurate prediction of digital phenotypes across domains and populations. There are consistently strong individual differences demonstrated in each of the domains I talked about. Sleep is maybe the best, um, and the more we look at mood, the more variable it is. And I think that I'm excited about this because there's an opportunity for individually customized well-being phenotype without data aggregation or centralization that would be more federated learning happening on one person's phone that doesn't need to be shared with others. And uh, that's pretty exciting. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I look forward to chatting more about this. And you can check out preprints on this on my webpage at the bottom.